Very early in the morning, the Gospel of Luke tells us, the women got up and went to Jesus' tomb. Which women exactly? Well, that's a question that Luke doesn't even bring up until later, but it's early and maybe he's a little tired in his writing too. They bring spices to anoint Jesus' body and prevent the smell of decay from taking over. It's been a day since anyone visited, since no one came to see his body on the Sabbath day, and they arrive to find that not everything is where they left it. Specifically, the stone that closed off the tomb that sealed it has been rolled away. Now, I'm sure they're worried, hurrying in to see what's happened. And not only has the tomb been disturbed, but it seems to have been looted of Jesus' body. He's nowhere to be found. Luke tells us that they stood there puzzled. Puzzled? Puzzled? It may be early and they may be tired, but I would bet that puzzled doesn't even begin to describe their emotion. Confounded. Worried. Frightened. Nothing is where they left it. Everything is unsettled. And now they're witnesses to what must feel like a crime scene. You know, before we continue the story, and thank goodness it doesn't end there, we should talk about this feeling that the women at the tomb are experiencing. It may sound very familiar to you, because many people today have been saying that's where things are in the church today. The church is in decline, scream headlines from articles in just the last few months. Majority of American churches now below 100 members. We're on a downward spiral. One headline even calls it a lifeless church. Even the Pew Research Foundation report shows that more and more people are calling themselves non-affiliated than ever before. And that's especially true amongst younger people within the Y and millennial generations. Now, whenever we meet new people our age or younger, my wife Ilana and I are often greeted with raised eyebrows when we say, hmm, we're pastors. Sometimes that's followed by, oh, that's cool. I used to go to church, but not since I left home or went to college, or lost my job. What's it like in the church these days? But yeah, that's really, really rare. Mostly the response is, how can you believe in that stuff? As though it's totally unreasonable to be a young person of faith. When I ask what they believe or why they left the church, usually the response is that they were hurt by a church who didn't take them seriously or wasn't interested in who they were, only that they were there. Sometimes they didn't believe the right things. Sometimes it's that they believe the church is corrupt and they can't believe the things that are being said. Now this sounds to me like the church, the body of Christ, is dead indeed. All that's left is an empty tomb and Jesus is nowhere to be found. Puzzling. Confounding. Like a nightmare. Where is the Savior? How can everything be all right? Bam! Suddenly, in the midst of the women, two men in dazzling clothes appear. The women are afraid. Afraid for their safety, already very off balance. But the men speak, saying, Why do you seek the living here with the dead? He isn't here. He arose from the dead, just as he said he would. What a shock! Remembering that Jesus had indeed predicted his death and resurrection, the women run away to tell the news to the men who, predictably, didn't go with. As Luke tells us, the men thought the story was nonsense and didn't believe them. At least five people all telling the same story and they're just dismissed out of hand. Yet one of them, Peter, seems to wake up, seems to believe them enough to check out what they're saying. He runs to the tomb and finds it empty, stone rolled away, empty wrappings on the floor, everything just as they said. And even he walks away wondering what had happened. What happened? Peter, you've had at least five people tell you what happened. Jesus rose from the dead. How can you not have faith in what others had experienced? How can we in the church not listen when others tell us what they've experienced in the church? When people tell me that they are dismissed, put down, ignored, or even hated by their church, it makes me want to scream. Not at them. At the people who've mistreated them so to turn over the tables, to shake things up just so that we can put the pieces back together in a new pattern. What 
new pattern, you ask? Well, really, it's an old pattern. The pattern of heart-first belief rather than head-first faith. Let's step back a moment for some word history. When Luke says the 11 men didn't believe the women, the word he uses for didn't believe is apisteo. In Greek, that prefix a negates the word it's attached to. So if we slide it off, we're left with the root word pisteo. And pisteo is a verb meaning to trust, to have faith. The men did not have faith in the women, didn't trust what they were saying, didn't trust in their experience. Now, when the gospel was translated into Latin, pisteo became credo. Credo literally means to set one's heart upon, to believe in something with your heart rather than with your head. There's an entirely different word in Latin, opinor, that means to believe something with your head, to hold an opinion, opinor, opinion. Now, in Latin, it means something akin to the men didn't set their hearts on what the women told them, as evidenced by their lack of action. But there's more translation. When the Bible was translated into German, credo became belieben, to set your heart upon, to love through your whole being. To love. Yes, liebe is the German word for love. Belieben, to love something with your whole heart. Now later in English, belieben became believe which at that time had the same meaning. To believe in something doesn't mean to hold an opinion on its existence, to hold it in your head. It means to love it with your whole heart, to live it with your whole life. Now, Diana Butler Bass puts it this way. In previous centuries, belief had nothing to do with one's weighing of evidence or intellectual choice. Belief was not a doctrinal test. Instead, belief was more like a marriage vow. I do, as a pledge of faithfulness and loving service to and with the other. Indeed, in early English usage, you could not hold claim, or possess a belief about God, but you could cherish, love, trust in, or devote yourself to God. So the 11 male disciples, they didn't put their trust in what the women said. Rather than putting trust, than believing them, than be loving them, if you will, it was as if their love was washing away. Even Peter had a hard time believing in Jesus' resurrection. But after a few years, man, Peter had fully awakened to God and put his entire belief, his entire heart into God, into Jesus, into the Holy Spirit. Peter is called to speak with a Roman centurion named Cornelius. This is a man who embodies spiritual but not religious. He is described as a God-fearing fellow with a God-fearing family in Acts, which is to say a Gentile, who worshipped God but had not even pledged to convert to Judaism. He does good things. He gives to the poor generously. He prays regularly. And one day he has an experience of God so powerful that he sends for Peter without even knowing who Peter is or what he'll say. Peter shows up. And unlike in Luke, now Peter has put his whole heart into the risen Christ, into the love of God. Peter says, it's clear to me now that God plays no favorites, that God accepts every person, whatever his or her culture or ethnic background, that God welcomes all who revere him and do right. All the prophets tell us about him and assert that every person who believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is a big deal. Up until this point, the disciples had only been reaching out to Jewish men and women, but Cornelius proved that God was interested in Gentiles too. Peter trusted in God, trusted in Jesus, believed with his whole heart that God was leading God's children to love all the world. This, my friends, 
is what it means to believe in Jesus. To be wakened to the needs of others. To love others as radically as Jesus did with your whole being believing, beloving, just as God loved you. You see, the church is not dead. It is alive, just as Jesus led us to be. The church buildings are but the shell. The body of Christ is alive and active in the world, healing, loving, reconnecting with people and their own walks with God. Don't sleepwalk in your community. Be wakened to each other's needs. Don't dismiss others' experiences. Believe in God working in their lives. Don't fear decline. Be loved by God and seek the living Lord among the living body. May you be reborn into love through Jesus. May you see God in your community. May the Holy Spirit resurrect your heart and lead you back to God's beloved path. Amen.